deploy stealth cam digital camera traps and pheromone chips on high ground, the rest of the crew sets out deeper into the swamp. Accessible only by airboat, these dangerous and remote waterways contain small islands and other lowlands that some researchers believe may be home to the skunk ape. Good. Um, we can bait the log out there, put a camera, set up our camera on this tree to pick up the whole wet prairie out there. Bambinek's goal, cover as much territory as possible, increasing his chances of an encounter with the elusive beast. Number one. If you can hold that there, let me hold on to it. Bambinek search area has a long history of sightings, including a recent report in 2006. In August, I uh, had a logging crew in there. Guy was driving and stopped, and he said this shaggy dog thing stood up. He said it was completely covered in black hair. He couldn't see any facial features. And ended up, it run off and ended up jumping into a bay and swimming off. A few days later, him and another guy were walking the survey line. And he said he looked up along the, the line and he said he saw this thing leaning over looking at it behind the tree. He said they hollered at it and said it turned and it went back toward their logging equipment that they just got off of. I've come back out here. We, uh, we measured the tracks for that day. We found 16 tracks. Um, I think they measured 14 inches. It is here that Babinek and Kessler want to try something else. A low-tech, but very effective scent tool. Let's see you guys. Bloodhounds. The dogs that tracked someone or something in 2000. Bloodhounds have been, you know, around for many, many years and used specifically for trailing and tracking. Tracking is following a specific scent step by step. Uh, if this person went this way, that dog is going to go right where that person stepped. John Prater and Kerry Foster are the dog handlers from the Shreveport Fire Department Search and Rescue. In trailing, it's doing somewhat the same thing, but with air currents. As that scent may travel or collect, the, do the person may have gone that way and then turned to where in trailing, the dog may cut off, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes off of the trail, but still be on the uh, scent and follow that person. If other people have been out in the woods, or if the scent that has been contaminated, we introduce that dog to everybody that is going to be around uh, during that trail so that the dog also understands that this is not the person I'm looking for and he knows that specific scent. Bloodhounds only detect living flesh or fresh skin cells, so when the pheromone chips with live ape bacteria are presented to the dogs, a live ape becomes their target. Critics argue if there are living apes, then there should also be dead apes. Wildlife expert Peggy Callahan plans an experiment that could shed light on why no carcass has been found. People always want to hear about how they live. Equally important to a scientist is how animals die and what happens beyond their death. There's so much exciting information to be learned just by watching one deer. Peggy Callahan and photographer Jim Tittle want to see how long it takes for a large animal carcass to decompose. This is our time-lapse camera housing. It's a waterproof camera case made out of plastic. In order to accommodate the camera, we've cut a hole right here in the side um, and attached a clear glass filter for the camera to look through. They have acquired a fresh roadkill deer carcass for the test fixed to the ground to prevent scavengers from carrying the deer away. For the most of the 
flesh and hair, etc., to disappear. I'm going to give it about a month in this kind of weather. Everything combined. For the bones, the bones will go to good use, but they'll be distributed across the countryside, across the landscape, and they'll disappear below, below leaf cover, below other plant life, etc. So we will not see evidence of this deer in two months. The camera will snap a picture of the carcass every 10 minutes for seven consecutive days. If the deer completely decomposes, it could explain why no dead skunk ape bodies are found, if they exist. Researcher Scott Kessler has never found physical evidence like bones, but Kessler does not need evidence to fuel his search. In 1977, near Trout, Louisiana, when he was just seven years old, Kessler says he encountered the skunk ape. And it was still real quiet, and I heard something hit the water. The really big thing that stands out that night was, was hearing the sound that was made when they came out of the water. Mwah. In 1977, Scott Kessler was just seven years old, camping with his family near Trout, Louisiana. Late that night, we was in camp, everybody was asleep. Uh, we had lanterns burning for safety and security in the camp. I remember the raccoons would come into camp every night, mess with what was left on tables. And I woke up around midnight or so, set up and looked out the window, and all of a sudden everything went real quiet. The coons started looking off into the woods like, hey, something big's coming, we need to, to respect it. And I looked back for the coons and they were gone and it was still real quiet, and I heard something hit the water. The really big thing that stands out that night was, was hearing the sound that was made when they came out of the water. Mwah. And then I heard it grunting, coming up the embankment, and it was about an eight-foot embankment, and when it stood up, it kind of like stretched up and expanded its chest and just stood there. I hunkered down where just my eyes were showing above the window, opening, and. I saw, it moved forward and then I heard something hit the water. I heard the same and it come up out of the water. And a smaller one came up over the embankment. That was all I needed to see and I laid down, covered up, and hope they like to get there pretty quick. Kessler remains convinced the creatures he observed as a child were not a known animal. But others are not so sure. It's a long history of uh, monkeys and, and primates uh, uh, going wild in southern Florida. In November 2006, this lone chimp was photographed near Gulf Breeze, Florida. The local zoo was contacted and all chimps were accounted for. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew ravaged Florida and Louisiana, releasing almost 300 dog-sized monkeys from the University of Miami Primate Center. Ron McGill believes the swamps of the southern U.S. could be home to escaped or released primates. There are countless thousands of acres of swampland between Big Cypress and the Everglades. Um, it is not unimaginable for an animal to remain secluded in that area without ever being seen by a human being. So I firmly believe that yes, an animal could adapt, a primate in fact could adapt to survive in the Everglades. And eyewitnesses continue to see them, like Ron Mayberry, in the summer of 2005 in the heart of the Big Cypress Preserve. When I first, you know, was coming down the trail and I seen it, I didn't know exactly what it was and uh, I stopped and just looked at it harder and it presumed to me as like a monkey. It was. Yeah, kind of shaped like a monkey. It squ squatted like a monkey. And it, you know, when it took off, it ran kind of like a monkey do does. And, uh, you know, I really couldn't tell if it had a tail on it or not. It was, you know, shorter, but a little bulkier, bulkier like in the shoulders. And... While Mabry was not able to estimate the size of the primate he saw, an escaped chimpanzee does fit his description. But how does one explain this? There were sightings of apes in this region long before zoos or private collectors. There is one newspaper account from the early 19th century. 
Now, this early 19th century newspaper account deals with what was called at the time the Man Mountain, which was supposedly this giant, hair-covered, half-human, half-ape monster that lived in the swamps of the Florida-Georgia border. At one point, two hunters are out uh, in, the, in the bottomlands in the swamp, and they find a track about 19 inches long and about 9 inches wide, unlike anything they've ever seen. And these are hunters, these are woodsmen, uh, so they're justifiably startled. That night, as they camp, uh, suddenly they're woken up by these huge, horrendous, bellowing screams. And they very quickly take off, getting out of the swamp as fast as they can, even leaving some of their gear behind in their haste. We went on a hunt. Mm -hmm. And once they the get back into civilization there, uh, the two guys begin to tell this story around. I first thought it was a human being that left the print, and then we had cold prints as well. Lots of people are intrigued. They describe the size of the tracks and the bellowing screams and all this sort of thing. And eventually, a party of, uh, of individuals, both from Georgia and Florida, gets together, and they're going to go out, and they're going to try to hunt this creature. And they are armed to the teeth with rifles and pistols and swords and all the weapons of the day. They set off into the woods there, into the swamps and the bottomlands. And they're out for, for quite some time, for like two weeks. So finally, after, after two weeks of frustrating effort and not really finding anything, they do find some tracks. And they make camp nearby and prepare to uh, look for the creature at first light. During the night, after everybody has dozed off and everybody's asleep, the camp is all quiet. And suddenly, they're actually attacked by this creature, uh, totally by surprise. And you can only imagine what it would be like to wake up to a, a 10, 12, 13 foot monster in your camp. Some of the guys managed to get up and grab firearms and get several shots off the creature. It was hit numerous times, but it still manages to kill uh, the majority of the party. And so they finish the creature off, and as they examine the creature's body in the dark, they find it to be this giant. 13 foot tall monster uh, with uh, huge muscles and just terrifying proportions. Uh, the survivors are fearful that the, uh, the commotion may attract other monsters, so they very quickly gather up some firearms and head out of the swamp, and of course they don't bother to take any part of the monster to actually verify their story, but the story was picked up by several other newspapers at the time. And just because you read it in the newspaper doesn't make it real. We know that in the 19th century that there were reporters actually making up really grandiose, bizarre stories. This could be one of them. But it's interesting because it does fit in with the more modern pattern of, um, of this swamp creature and with footprints and a lot of similarities to, uh, to what is reported in the 20th century. Primate expert Crystal Lemaster has been studying the best photo of the alleged swamp creature. The question is, is it a hoax or a real animal? The hair looks pretty long for an orangutan and pretty manicured, so to speak. Um, an orangutan that's out there in the wild, you know, living by himself, probably wouldn't be quite so manicured in those conditions. After looking at all the photos,